Hey, Rob Castellano. What's up, Rob? Rob's one of our clients out in out in uh, LA. We just finished his brand a couple of months ago. It uh, he's killing it out there. Good guy, plumbing. Um, really awesome guy. Great brand, and uh, you know, really embraced the idea of being disruptive, and it's uh, definitely working out well for him. So. Um, you know, listen, we got, it's 2.05, so let's, let's just get into this. And again, as we're going, if you guys have questions um, and you want to um, post any questions on the chat, feel free. Um, Tim, no, you should just see me at this point. <laughs> You're on these, that's awesome. Okay, so um, let's go here. So Truck wraps, right? All begins with the brand. It's the most critical aspect of an effective truck wrap design. It's really, honestly, the reason why so many, so many wraps that are out there today just don't work, and it's because of the brand. And you know, we have so many clients who come to us and they say, you know what? Hey, we really want to get a new truck wrap design from you, and um, they'll say they'll send us their logo and we'll take a look at it. We'll see if it's something that we can work with. And more often than not, it's, it's something that's not going to work well for the medium. So that's something that we, we definitely want to address. And we tell them about the challenges with their existing logo. We tell them, you know, maybe there's reasons why it's not going to work on the medium, uh, whether there's a topography issue, whether it's just a poor logo itself. Um, and we explain to them all the challenges of what potentially, would cause that truck wrap to not be effective. So we kind of leave it up to them as far as whether or not they want to proceed with that. But it's really something that we stress that in the absence of having a great brand, it's nearly impossible to really have an effective truck wrap. So that's the starting point. So the brand is kind of this, this word that people throw around and you know it's more than just a logo. So I just want to kind of run through what that brand really signifies and what that means. So you look at brands, you look at um, branding from a sense of, wait, there's no video. You guys see the video or just Sally doesn't see the video? Okay. All right. So think about branding from the sense that the logo is the center of a brand. It's kind of like the wheel and around the wheel, you've got, you've got this part, right? So you've got the, the, the web design, uniforms, print, outdoor, including the truck wrap, social media, stationary. Um, so the logo is the hub that the brand is built around. Um, it provides the driving force to which everything else is built. Positive brand promise is something that we talk a lot about. So brand promise deals with the concept of what does someone think about your brand just from the visuals? So what assumptions do they make about your company just from looking at what that logo is? And if that logo is on the side of the truck, I don't know anything at all about this plumbing company, but I see this logo on the side of the truck. What am I thinking about? What, what, what feelings and emotions and what do, I, what do I expect to get if I chose to do business with that company? So it's something that you really have to really make sure you've got that dialed in because if you don't have that dialed in and you put this message out there, now you're delivering the wrong brand promise. Now you're talking to your customers and you're not telling them the reasons why they should hire you. So we always want to control that first impression. That's really what the truck wraps are meant to do. They're meant to really reinforce why that is a good decision for that consumer to hire them. So I don't know anything at all about this company. I just happen to see you driving through this neighborhood. What do I think about that company before I pick up the phone? So I want to, I want to control that first impression. I want to control that perception that that, that potential customer has and make it so that they have a good understanding of what they might expect to get. The real problem with most contractors is that they provide a great service but if you judge them by how they looked, you don't really assume that. So that's what the, the branding is so critical to that. So, you know, just an example here showing brand integration, showing all the different things. So here's the logo itself. Here's integration on outdoor. Here's some collateral and, and door hangers, stationary. Um, we just actually redid the Timo's truck wrap design. It was something I, you could see it here, but this was done about eight years ago and we did an update on it recently. So um, again, branding, big term that people throw around. Just think about it from these ways, right? A brand is what people feel about your company. A brand is what people say about your company behind your back. They're talking to their friends. What would they say about your company? How would they explain who you are to that company? Um, and certainly a brand is the perception of your company that's, that's 
informed by all these different touch points. So they, they saw an ad on Facebook, they saw your truck in the neighborhood, they saw a site sign, and they saw a business card or a guy in uniform. What do all those touch points speak to? What do they, what do they tell that customer um, about that company? Um, so vehicles certainly one of the most important aspects of that brand experience because they see that truck driving through the neighborhood, they know you're working at a neighbor's house or they have saw, saw it on the road, they know you're in the community, so how do they feel about that company as they form this impression based on those visuals? So again, we want to make sure that we could try to basically do the best job we can to personify the positive aspects of that company with the branding. So characteristics of good brands. And this is where we can talk about, again, if you have, um, you know, examine what your own brand looks like and determine whether or not you think it answers these questions in the right way. So uh, they are disruptive. So when I say disruptive is meaning they don't fit in, they stand out for the right reasons. You know, I got examples in here later that we'll go through the talk and show some very, I would say, you know, crazy truck wraps and then, you know, they catch your eye, but what does it say about the company is really the question that's not being answered correctly. So um, a good brand should help answer some of the important questions as to why someone should want to hire you. So they deliver a positive brand promise and a perceived value proposition setting an expected um, setting an expected deliverable, meaning, again, I don't know anything at all about this company except the visuals. Now when I go to call them up, I have a certain expectation as to what I'm going to get, that the company is reputable, that the company is going to be around next year. Those are all things that, you know, the right visuals should really speak to. Um, they use easy to read topography. You know, we, we've all seen truck wraps that they drive by and you can't read anything on it. Um, again, topography is such an important um, play such an important role in having an effective truck wrap design. They help tell the right story quickly and efficiently. So you see truck wraps out there where, you know, they drive by and you're not even sure what they do. So that's obviously not a good use of that marketing dollars. If the truck drives by, it's colorful and it looks neat. But at the end of the day, either I don't know what they do or I don't know the name of the company. Um, so again, it's kind of a waste of, of that, um, the money spent there if those questions can't be answered quickly and efficiently. Um, instilling themes like confidence, security, longevity, um, and having a memorable name certainly helps. You know, in, in the previous seminar that I just did, um, I spoke a lot about um, having names that are really hard for people to remember. You know, if you have a name that is initial based, like JSW uh, Heating and Air, you know, or anything like that, ADP landscaping, you know, those are names that really have nothing to latch onto. So um, those are typically the most challenging names that you can have to brand. If I have a client that comes to me with a name like that, I'm going to lay out the challenges that we would have with such a name as far as getting traction with it, getting people to remember it, getting that brand to be sticky, very difficult with the wrong name. So Again, you, you're in a sensitive area when you're talking to clients about changing their name because they've achieved a certain level of the success with that name. And now you're proposing to them that maybe that there's um, a problem with that name. So um, it's not something to be treated lightly for sure, but certainly if there's an issue with the name that may affect the effectiveness of what you feel you can do for them from a campaign standpoint, you know, point out the challenges of, of gaining traction with it. Certainly we've done it before but I can say that they're the hardest ones that we do. You know, there isn't an awful lot that I can get, you know, JPM heating and air to latch onto. There's not a visual that goes with JPM that I can associate that visual with that name. So think about it from that perspective. If you have a name that really doesn't personify or connect in any way to what the value proposition is, um, you know, it's something to consider, you know, air expert sounds like a better company than AGP heating and air. Why? Because, well, they're the experts. It sounds like they should be better. So it's something to definitely think about. Um, so talking about wrap design, I think I have a unique perspective in wrap design only because I started in the industry when I was, you know, I guess 30, 30 years ago or so, I probably lettered my first van when I was 15 or 16 years old. So um, a lot of tools have come um, in the design world to make certain parts easier. And they've also come at the expense of some foundational things that I think inhibit why some of the wraps today f fail. So, you know, uh, layouts had to be reduced to the most simplistic form because it wasn't just a matter of clicking a button to add a drop shadow or to add a bevel or anything like that. 
Um, you're also trained more so to make effective use of the canvas. You know, the experience of hand lettering a truck um, is hard to replicate behind the desk. You know, when you're out there on the side of a truck, hand lettering it and really trying to study the canvas and figure out where your elements should live, it's very different than doing it um, digitally for sure. Um, adding, um, you couldn't add effects easily, like we mentioned, shadows, uh, bevels, outlines, all those things really, if you were going to do them, there needed to be a reason for you to do them. So often you tried to work and make sure that your layouts were effective before you added any effects. Um, and certainly I think they had a, a much better understanding of the medium sometimes because they were physically out there doing it. So why are truck wraps a unique opportunity to be disruptive? So like we mentioned earlier, most of the truck wraps that you see on the road today are illegible. They don't really work very well and they're tough to read. So that presents a great opportunity right in itself. So if, if the truck wraps that are out there today are not something that are legible, well, what would happen if you um, branded your business in a way that was legible, that people could read, that, that people would, would see as being something that's different than what they're used to seeing? So that's a great opportunity because if most of the truck wraps are not good and yours suddenly is one of the best, then suddenly you draw a lot of attention to yourself. Um, a lot of the problems, we, like we said earlier, they don't integrate brands in a way that convey professionalism. So again, if you can integrate a brand on a truck wrap that shows the value proposition from the visuals, it's certainly something that tends to stand out much more. Um, information overload, you guys, you know, there's, there's so many things that people are trying to cram onto a truck wrap. And, and what we try to do is really distill it into its most simplistic form. We try to make it show there's the least amount of information I need to convey what it is that that company does. Uh, so instead of trying to put, you know, for a plumber, I'm not going to put that you fix toilets and that you also install sinks and that you also do hot water heaters because that's, that's kind of a given, you know, and it's not the right medium for to, to have a bullet list on the side of a truck. Um, so, you know, again, what we said, what would happen if that business had better branding? What would happen if the business looked as impressive as the work that it provided? You know, and that's really, I think, the, the, the challenge that we see is we have all, all these people who want to want to project the service that they actually deliver. And, and they can't do it when the brand doesn't work. So that's really the, you know, we have so many clients, oh, we want we want, we love these truck wraps that you guys do. We want something just like it. And then I look at what the brand is and I can't get there. Like I can't, I can't project professionalism from a brand that doesn't speak to professionalism. It's just not going to work. So again, we try to advise our clients on the challenges of what that brand is, what that brand communicates, and um, how, to ch how to change that impression, and then from there, build the truck wrap. So, um, and as you guys, most people know, the ROI um, is, is ridiculous in comparison to other mediums. You, you can't buy more impressions at a lower cost point than truck wrap. So it's obviously one of the most important um, and effective uh, marketing dollars. So... Anyone have any questions on this specifically before I move on to anything? If you have anything, just pop it on there. If not, I'm going to just keep going. So using truck, truck wraps to be a disruptor. You know, I, I love this photo here of this truck wrap that we did for Zoom Drain. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a franchise that we rebranded recently. And you kind of look through the whole landscape here. And you've got all this kind of greenery. And then you've got this bright blue. It's like a blue green that we use there that's you know, it's really disrupting that space, but it's still speaking to all the things we wanted to. It looks professional. It looks like they, you know, they're going to be around next year if something goes wrong with my plumbing. You know, so all these questions, all these impressions are being formed by those visuals and it's very memorable. So that's the whole idea behind some of the work that we do is making it so it communicates the right message and that it's memorable. So again, here's, here's, here's a, not a truck wrap, Exactly, obviously, but who's really going to get the job? Who looks like they're more professional? You know, and, and you see people do this all the time where they, they go the cheapest way possible to get something out there and then they wonder why they can't get the dollars that they feel like they should. Um, it's because they don't look like they deserve to get the dollars that they should. If both of these companies rolled up on the driveway, which one do you think gets the job? even if they're at similar price points or even if one of them is more expensive, because I feel like one's going to be in business next year. And this guy, I'm not too sure where he's going to be next year. So this is obviously an extreme example, 
but there's degrees of this. And that's the whole point of, of really the effective brands. Um, what do you do when a client is unwilling to change their brand? Do you still work with them? In most instances, we do not because I just don't feel good about taking money for something that I know isn't going to work. So I'll explain the challenges with what they have. And if they're unwilling to change, I just wish them the best of luck. And, and that's really all I can do at that point. I just can't take money from someone to deliver something that I know isn't going to work. Um, so Matt, yeah, you like the comic sans and the brush script. <laughs> So a um, couple of examples of some, some rebrands that we've done, you know, and we like to use these as examples for folks who are on the fence, right? Well, why, why should I change my logo? Cause it's been working all these years. So, um, you know, these a couple of, here's a couple of examples, 46% increase in sales in the first year of rebranding. I mean, 46%. So look at the ROI on the investment in the new logo and the investment on the truck wrap. You know, it, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's amazing. 55% increase in sales after one year with the new brand. Sunny Plumber is a, a large company out of uh, Phoenix and Vegas. And, you know, and their old brand, it's not that their old brand was, was terrible. Like this one, it wasn't even really to the extent where I would say it's, it's completely not communicating what it should be. It was okay, you know, but the new brand really just takes it to another whole level. And that's what sometimes it's about too. You know, it's about really rethinking it. Clear the Air is another one out of, out of Texas. You know, the old brand, at least it was legible and I could see it, but certainly the new brand just has more elements that I think are memorable, you know, in a 300% increase in sales after three years. I mean, that's an impressive statistic. I mean, and, and again, this goes to show the power of what that brand really can do to a business. So for folks that are on the fence about whether or not this is a good investment, these are some of the examples we'd like to use to show why it's so important. Uh, so somebody just said, um, how do you tell a client that their logo isn't working? So again, just try to point out the deficiencies in the existing brand. You know, what, what about that brand will not work on the medium in which you're being asked to deploy it? So whether it's got poor topography, whether the illustration is, is you know, really bad clip art, whether, um, you know, it's just is something that's not effective to communicate what it is that they do or how powerful. So um, so Rob, examples, yeah. I mean, if you want to use some examples and credit us, that's you know that's that's totally fine. But um, you know, anything. What about wraps for realtors or anything with corporate logos in general? So um, if if that's the mandate, if it's coming from a corporate level and that's their logo, they're obviously not going to change it. That's kind of a different story. We don't really get asked to do a lot of wrap design for people that live in that realm. It's more for like contractors typically, but we've done our share of, of wrap design for people and, and on the corporate side that did have decent logos. Um, and we were happy to do the design work for them. So, you know, this company had a tracking number on their phone number, uh, a tracking number on their truck, I should say, and 865% increase. And, and it, this wasn't a full wrap, but just goes to show you how a more effective design really can get that phone to ring more. Uh, Timo's had a 400% increase in sales after four years with their new brand. Um, and then this is really the one that's just absurd in terms of uh, a, a statistic. Uh, Gettle went from $8 million to $40 million in three years since we rebranded them. That's a $32 million increase. I think this stat is actually even a little bit um, short right now. I think last time I talked to the owner, I think that they're pushing almost $50 million. So, um, you know, I'm not going to take 100% of the credit for um, that success, but I will say that the rebrand for them was really the the turning point for them. You know, that's really what started them on this brand message that all went back to speak to, you know, this boy. And this is the owner's son, actually, uh, an illustration we did of the owner's son. But it's meant to represent when the owner himself started working in the business, he would hold a flashlight for his dad. So that whole story really started from this truck wrap design and this brand that we created for them. So they use that story and they, they, they infuse that story in all their marketing about how he started the company and that's how he learned and grew up in the company. So now you see this, you know, they've got to have 50 or 60 of these trucks now running around, you know, and you see this boy and you've heard the radio commercials and you've seen the billboards and now everything really makes sense. So this is really, I think, one of, one of the more powerful examples. And, and this was their previous brand. 
you know, it was okay, but, but it didn't speak to this. There, there wasn't a lot to latch onto, you know, so this new face that we put on this Gettle brand has just been, you know, really successful for them and, and certainly has worked out as you can see the numbers. I mean, um, it's been a, a great experience and, and Ken who, who runs the business is just a great guy and, and really, um, you know, the, the, again, the service that his company and his team provides is now represented in this brand. So there's, there's no disconnect. So that's, that's the beauty of it is when you marry up what the company looks like the same way that when the guy rings the doorbell and actually provides the service, if those things are in harmony, then it's a home run. Then, then all these things are working the way that they should be. So again, a couple examples of some of the rebrands here. You know, this was their previous logo. Um, again, here is their previous logo. You know, some other examples. These are so, somewhat retro based ones. Um, and here's, you know, a couple of ones showing in action. So here's, here's Cornerstone Air. They're, they're in Florida. You know, a lot of, a lot of things not to do. You know, they, they have four diff three different phone numbers on here for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so, you know, just things like this didn't communicate the same things that this does. You know, fair, fast, and friendly. You know, okay, well, that's, that's a nice value proposition. You know, I know I'm not going to get ripped off or I think I'm not going to get ripped off because of how it's presented to me. So um, a good example of a before and after. This is a client that we did their rebrand and you can see their truck wrap design over here. So, um, you know, started answering uh, Pete's question here. So um, to a certain extent, you know, this company here was, when they called us up, they actually called us up because they wanted us to design their, their website. So I, I was speaking to them and I said, you know, listen, we can do a website for you if that's what your logo looks like. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can. But the reality is, is that, you know, your logo is something you can't even own. You've got an American Eagle on here and a flag and um, this topography on here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's that one that's really, it's not good. I can't remember the name because we never use it. But uh, so I spoke to him about the challenges. I said, listen, you know, the work that you guys do is, is amazing. Like they work on these old homes that are very specialized. It's a very niche business that he's in but you can't get there looking at this. And he said, but Dan, everybody knows our trucks. I said, that's true. Um, everyone does know your trucks, but what, what do the trucks speak to them is really the question I want to know. Like what, what, what do they think they're going to get if they call up your company after I saw this truck? Does it, does it look like a premium brand, like the service that you actually provide or does it not? You know, so I, I understand the argument of saying people have seen our trucks all the time. They know our trucks because people say that, Oh, you know, people know, know us by our trucks. Well, that's great. What did they know about you by your trucks is the question that we, we want to ask. Is it something that speaks to them about how great your service is? Or is it just they happen to remember seeing it? That's fine if they remember seeing it. Like, okay, but what does it say is the question that I'm trying to make sure we answer before. So, you know, a pretty distinct before and after. Certainly, I would have remembered seeing these vans but I, I wouldn't have remembered the impression that it gave in terms of being a positive impression. It's a much different thing. Um, Air Zero, another company out in Florida that we did their brand for. Again, this is at least legible, um, but this looks certainly a lot more professional. Um, so, um, so Pete, I just want to go back to your question, touchy conversation for rebrands in a conservative area, not so much. I feel we can't necessarily afford to lose the work. So, do you feel like you had a stake in the ground moment when you decided to stop working with clients if they didn't rebrand? You know, Pete, on, honestly, it's, it can't be for everyone that you can simply just say, I can't work with you um, because your logo is terrible. Um, I know some guys just can't do that. And I, I completely understand that. You know, we're blessed to be um, busy enough where I don't, I don't have to take every job that comes on. But on, on the other hand, too, I, I would feel to a certain extent that I'm not advocating for them in a way that makes sense for me to feel good about taking their money to deliver something that I feel like it couldn't work. Some guys are like, well, I'll just take the money and cash the check. And, you know, I understand that some people have to do that and, and, and that's totally fine. And, and I get it, you know, sometimes that's what you, you got to do. But, you know, in a lot of instances, I feel like we've gained more respect from clients when we, when we express our objections to what their brand looks like and do the best we can to explain why that that might not work. Um, so, um, rich air again an example here showing some of the problems um, you know very very difficult um, hard to read um, and um, you know it's something that 
obviously the new brand speaks more to. Um, so Michael, you, you know, you're right as far as uh, walking a fine line, you know, we, I'm not, I'm not, I don't say with any ego, I just express to him the concerns that we have and how we might be able to better address that with a, with a more polished brand. But understand this, that no matter what, even for myself, having my own brand that I kept for 20 something years, it, it's like a warm blanket. So understand that these, these are people that have had success with that brand and now you're telling them that that brand could use an update. Um, so you have to tread very lightly and, and you know, we're very honest about what the objections we might have with it and how we might make it better. And then ultimately it's really up, up to them to decide uh, whether or not that that's something they want to embark. But, you know, we also make sure we try to educate our clients on, on the trauma that's involved in rebranding. It's not a decision that anyone should enter lightly. You know, everything needs to change. You've got to redo stationary business cards, uniforms. Um, on our website, on, uh, on the top of the website, there's a link to view um, what we call a, a roadmap. So you can look at that roadmap and that will help um, get an understanding of what the implications are for changing the logo itself. So we also send them that link and try to say, hey, here's what here's the things that are going to happen if you rebrand. So just so you know, going into it, it's going to be something that has to um, evolve over time. We also try to say, listen, we know you've got five other trucks that are already wrapped and we're not expecting you to go and strip those all off and start from scratch. So it's certainly something that will take some time for you to get that new brand in place. It's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to roll out six trucks on a weekend probably. Um, and there's also some cost involved. You know, maybe you just wrap two brand new trucks. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that have to be really um, spoken to. So exactly like the hub being the, being the center. So if that hub, if you got a wheel with a bad hub, then everything else around it is never going to be round. It's going to, the wheel is going to be all messed up. So that's something else to definitely consider. Um, Harold King, another example. This is kind of a cool brand that we did for him because they actually went and made this mascot that we designed into a physical mascot. So that physical mascot goes to different parades that they have a long time around town and they also go to some various um, softball games, things like that. So that's something also that's pretty neat when you do a brand like that, that then suddenly becomes the, the, the physical mascot of an actual company. So Six rules we have for disruptive truck wraps. So again, the rules, can they be broken? Of course they can. Uh, but these are the kind of the rules that we try to follow when we do our truck wraps. So like we said, start with a great brand. The reason why so many fail is the poor brand. Poor branding dooms the ROI. So express to them how this wrap design um, may not be as effective as it could be because of these deficiencies. Um, so. Again, they're about to spend three, four thousand dollars to get a truck wrap design. Now might be the time to really have that conversation before they spend that before they spend that money. So, an example of one we have here is, is a company called Ray the Plumber. They're out in Long Island, and Ray's Ray's a great guy. We he we worked with him on the Zoom Drain brand as well. And when he first started with us, he's like, "Dan, I can't change my logo. Like everybody knows me by that logo." And and you know, I said, "Ray, listen." I understand everyone knows you by that logo, right? It's, he's got 30 of those trucks driving around Long Island and that's the way he's had them for years. But I'm like, it, it doesn't express to me who you are. You know, it, it still looks dated. You know, there's a lot of things about it that I would, would do over. And, and this is a guy who had invested so much in that brand between radio and TV commercials, all those things. And I said, right, we can do something better. You know, and, and finally he said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to hire you to do it. Um, and then I'll decide if I really want to integrate And Some people do that. They're like, they, they, you know, they want to pay us to, for our time to do it and then decide after, and that's fine. We'll, we'll do that. But in any instance that we've done that, they've always switched after we've, we've presented them a new, a new brand. So here's the new band, you know, and we did something a little bit different and leading in with the, with the yellow, as far as keeping the whole thing blue. Um, and this is a very rare example for us, um, about having photography. Um, and that was the one thing that I couldn't, I couldn't change his mind on. And I don't know that I necessarily tried that hard to change his mind on this particular instance, because I think it works. I'm not, I'm not really distracted by this background imagery. Um, so we opted to keep that consistent. Um, so this is a company that's local to us here in New Jersey that we just recently rebranded. And again, this is a company that came to us for some other marketing 
and we said, you know, your current logo is okay, right? I mean, it's, it's okay. I can read it. It's Air Professionals and, you know, it looks kind of professional, but what would be something that I would be more likely to remember driving down the road? What would be something that would be more disruptive? And then this is the new brand that we did for them. We came up with a tagline for them. That's the tagline is um, comfort mandatory, tuxedos optional. And, you know, this little guy now has infused so much new energy into this company. It's been, it's been crazy. Like I just spoke to the client the other day and um, so well received by his clients. Um, and, you know, you see this van driving around. It's cool for us because we don't see a lot of our own work. And I happened to be driving down the road and, and saw this thing coming at me. And I was like, bam, that's it. That's, that's exactly what we were trying to do. We we're trying to make something disruptive that people would really remember. Um, you know, and here's an example showing, you know, here's the fleet of their old vans. Again, it, it, it works okay. I can read it. You know, every, the hierarchy is okay. But there's certainly some elements here that would make this a lot more memorable. And then we came up with a tagline and we put our heart into service. So now I've really tried to connect the visual with the, with the value proposition. So this is, a, again, a, an example of something that's a little bit more memorable. Obviously, the colors are, are, you know, they're, they're common for heating and air, but I think the way we executed this particular brand is something that you don't see often. But you can even look here, as you see all these vans lined up, there's nothing really disruptive about them. You know, they all kind of blend. So that's, again, what we tried to solve here. So avoid using photos when possible. So I know a lot of, a lot of companies want to try to use photos. They think photos tell a lot of uh, stories, and, and sometimes they can. We just look at it from the perspective of a brand. So for us, photos don't represent, brand, don't represent brands. So that's why I usually don't use photos. I, I'd say out of the last 250 wrap designs that we've done here, I think there's only been one instance where I've used a photo and it was for a furniture company. Um, so I just don't think that photos work for truck wraps. I think that they come at the expense of, of a brand. Sometimes if you have a poor brand, it can help because maybe you can at least get people to visually connect. Um, and, you know, certainly for national brands, it's, it's fine. You know, McDonald's having, you know, a picture of a Big Mac on the side of their trailer. Yeah, you know, obviously that's fine, but it's very difficult to associate a specific photo with a specific brand. To me, they get dated, they get stale over time. Um, and Certainly, I think they also present the challenges as far as when you lay out a truck wrap design that uses a photo, um, how do you do that in a way that still maintains legibility? So I'm going to show some examples in here, and, and I in no means am trying to be critical of who, whoever designed them, because I don't know. I just grabbed some stuff off the internet to use as examples. I certainly don't mean to disparage whoever designed them, um, just mean to show illustrative purposes. Um, and it could be that that's exactly what the client wanted and that's what they did. So I don't make any assumptions and I just want to point that out because I'm not trying to, um, you know, point out or call out anyone specifically because I don't know what happened and I don't know what uh, may have transpired to get to that point. So just, I'm just putting that out there so you guys um, know. So, um, so just want to point out like an example of why the photo rule, I think, it, it works. So here's one that we did for an appliance repair business. And I think it works very well. And then here's another appliance repair business. And I've got a photo of two guys here. I don't know what these two guys are doing. Um, and I don't know how it relates to the brand. But the, the thing that I see first here is, you know, I've got Same Day Service um, Company, Inc. Um, this is something that we'll talk about to never put on any of the work that you guys do. Um, Inc. Inc. should never be part of a logo or a brand. Um, so if there's one takeaway today, remember that piece of it. Um, but you've got appliance repair, which is really kind of prominent. And then you've got um, these two guys, I guess. But now I'm not sure the name of the company. So, you know, just kind of an example of showing how it doesn't really do much to really enhance the messaging. Are these the two guys that are actually showing up on the job? I doubt it. So what is it adding to it? It's not even a picture of an appliance. Here's another example showing a photo. And you would say, wow, I would really remember seeing this truck it's got this this huge photo of this sandwich on here right and that's cool it, so it's it's a sandwich restaurant kind of thing we've got catering cornage salads lunch fresh sandwich cookies now look at the amount of real estate devoted to the brand right we've got a postage stamp on the door 
So how, how am I going to really connect the dots here? I've got a huge sandwich. I've got catering, cornered salads, lunch, fresh. Oh, this is for the corner bakery cafe. Now, now imagine I'm trying to pick that out at 50 miles an hour driving down the side of the road. You tell me what the key takeaway is. It's a sandwich van. Outside of the sandwich van, I don't know who it's for. And, and again, the photo comes at the expense of the brand. It's, it's ironic because it's a cool brand and I like their logo, but it's, it's too much and it takes away from the brand. Here's another one, right? So it's the same, same company. Now, I initially thought the name of this company was somehow called Catering because I thought this was their logo. I'm like, oh, Catering. Ooh, that's a weird name for a business, but oh no, that's sort of what they do. And again, here's their little postage stamp over here of showing what they do. So just kind of an example of showing why, you know, photos in theory sound like that they should be a good idea, but the reality in a, in a, in a scenario like this is it really comes at the expense of the brand. I don't know who this photo is representing. So therefore why, why have it? So um, copy, certainly limiting the amount of copy that your wrap design or, or that you want to have on your wrap is something that's really important. Again, somebody just posted five seconds to digest the info. Yeah. Five seconds. So how much stuff can we put on there? Keep it focused on the brand, avoid the bullet list, and imagine that this canvas is really a, a, a billboard and you're driving by that billboard at 50 miles an hour. Think about how fast you have to digest that information and how much information can get on there. So web, phone, logo, tagline. I mean, we're even at the point now where a lot of clients, and we're happy to hear it, but they're like, just forget about the phone number. We don't, we don't need a phone number, just put a website address. Because think about it. I mean, you're telling Siri to call up the guy that just drove in front of you if you wanted to contact him. You're not really probably, you know, typing in the phone numbers anymore. So, you know, listen, a lot of times we have the real estate to put phone numbers, so it's fine. But really, who's using phone numbers now? It's, it's really all with smartphones. You know, and no one, right, someone, no one has a pen and paper to write down a number. So exactly. So think about it from that perspective. Try to distill as much of it as you can. And if the brand is done right, you can certainly get it. So here's one that is my, one of my all-time favorites. This, this was a, a van I happened to take a photo of in, in Staten Island. And I don't, I'm not even sure the name of the company. Um, you, it's, it's really some crazy stuff. And this is obviously to the, to the nth degree of why not to have this much content. And uh <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, you know, he's living the dream though. So God bless him. And, uh, you know, it's just way too much though. So, uh, you know, you can kind of get the idea, you know, here's an example too, not a terrible brand, but the way in which it's integrated here is something that, you know, there's just so many things going on for some strange reason. We have two logos on here and we have two sets of the same phone numbers right next to each other. So I actually don't know what was happening in this particular instance, uh, but you can see even here the bullet lists that are so small and hard to read from a distance, it kind of takes away. Like this, this, this design could have been really effective. It could have been you know, huge. You could have blown up this mascot. It's kind of a cool little mascot. Um, and you could have really done a much better job on this particular wrap, but you could kind of see by having this many bullets how that didn't work. So here's another carpet um, cleaning company that we rebranded and you could kind of see, you know, the difference, you know, I've got the name of the company, clean, repair, die. And then we're mad about carpets as their tagline. So it's a very simple design. I could tell that they do something with carpets by the visual, the colors attract my attention and I don't have to work too hard to figure out what it is that they do. Um, Another carpet cleaning company, Orange You Glad. This is a company that hired us to actually name them as well. And, and that business, um, again, these vans driving down the road, very disruptive, orange. You know, the, they use citrus-based cleaners, which is why we came up with a name for them like that. And, you know, you could see how much more effective that that is. So, you know, we talk about designing to stand out and not fitting in. A lot of that is really dealing with the fact that you want to try to design truck wraps that are atypical from what people are traditionally seeing in their neighborhood. So uh, reducing the design to its most simplistic basic form, um, thinking about it from an atypical standpoint, meaning if we can have something that's distilled to its most simplistic form, that's easy for people to understand, easy to remember, a unique color scheme, things like that, 
you know, those are typically elements of a design that are going to stand out. Um, so uh, we also like to include a component of their brand and make that a very large graphic. Back in the day, it used to be called super graphics. It's not really a, a prevalent term today, but you know, in the late 80s and 90s, there was a few sign painters that really kind of pioneered that, that term. And they used it in a lot of the billboard work that they did. And they used it in a lot of the vans that they, that they had created. They used this super graphic. And that's something that we really try to do. So there's an element from the brand that maybe we're going to blow up. Maybe it's their mascot. Maybe it's an element of um, their actual mark that we're going to use as a very large graphic. So I want people to, when they see this large graphic, to remember this company. So um, again, doesn't mean pink and purple. Um, I mean, pink and purple. I mean, I just use apple green and purple. But um, it's more about what the brand says, not just about being noticed. So, you know, again, this is, this is a truck wrap design that you would say, well, that would, that would stand out. That's disruptive. It's orange and it's yellow and it's, and it's, um, it's black. Um, but I, I, you know, there, there's so much going on here that you can't read any of this. You know, this is a retro fitness truck wrap. I, it's actually, um, I, I do some cycling and I pass by this truck, this truck wrap every time I, I pass it. And, uh, I don't know what was supposed to be accomplished with something like this. And, and it's a shame because someone spent a lot of money on this, but the, the, the message is really lost, um, on a wrap like this. So it is, it does stand out, but it stands out for the wrong reasons. And yeah, Michael, like you said, 1999 might be the, uh, the only way to, the only thing to pick out at a glance maybe in 1999 for what I, I honestly think that this is supposed to be some photos maybe back in here of an actual gym. This is a fitness place, but I, you know, I don't, I don't really know what's happening there. So again, going back to the peep, the purple and, and pink thing, this is a, you know, a, a plumbing company and yes, you would say it's disruptive. Yes, it stands out. Uh, but what does it say about the company is really the question that I think isn't being answered correctly. Um, you know, if, if I'm looking to get, you know, a high end uh, plumbing fixture installed on my $50,000 kitchen, you know, is this the company that I think is really best suited for that? Do they look like they do premium high end work or do they look like they don't do such high end work? So part of thinking about that is, is really trying to figure out what does the visuals convey and, and what does it say about the company? You know, a couple of things just from a purely a design standpoint, you know, there's, I think there's a total of five different typefaces being used in this design as well. So, you know, those types of things really run contrary to what, you know, design should communicate. So uh, again, you know, I thought at first that this truck wrap had something to do with like breast cancer awareness or something like that. Uh, but I could find no indication anywhere that it had anything to do with breast cancer awareness. So I wasn't really sure why there was a pink ribbon on it. So, um, you know, um, so again, you can have a lot of colors and you can use colors to your advantage and you can, you know, get a message out there that is still legible. So I wanted to just show this one as an example, because here's, you know, you could say that this is, you know, a little busy because you've got the, the, the fan fold of all the, the paint swatches here, but I still know what the brand is and I still can tell what they do. So it can be done. You just have to think about how that brand is integrated and how to deploy the graphics to communicate that message. Um, do you use one way vinyl? Often do you cover windows? Um, we don't do any installations. We only do design, but when we do designs that go over windows, we try to advocate to our clients to cover the windows with standard vinyl if possible. Um, so, you know, again, simple and obvious message should contain one primary takeaway. Don't let imagery obscure the message. Uh, brands should be reinforced integrating unique colors um, and slight brand adjustments can still maintain the brand and be more in impactful. So when we talk about brand adjustments, meaning again, maybe taking an element of the brand and using it as a background image or using it as something that's very large. Um, you know, as an example, you know, here's a handyman service and I don't think there's really any confusion about what they do. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great name. Um, the secondary copy is legible and I've got this cute mascot that really indicates to me someone that's, you know, out there to fix something. You know, this is all vector based, by the way. Um, I think I had mentioned earlier that almost all the work that we do is, is vector based. Um, so we, you know, we use the wood grain panel in here um, to really 
you know, help show that they obviously work with wood and that they're a handyman. So, you know, this is a really nice design. It's very clean. There isn't a ton of things going on. It almost looks like a franchise. And, you know, going back to the things that we talked about as far as what questions am I trying to answer? So handyman services traditionally are, are not really people that we think are on the up and up. Like we, they don't have a great repu reputation. If you say I'm a handyman, people may not have the right impression of really what you do. So how do we diffuse that? How do we deflect that? You know, how do we make it so that this brand now makes it so when you call them up to come do a, a task at your house, you feel like that they're reputable. And I think that this truck wrap is a perfect illustration of that because it really speaks to how it is that this brand personifies, you know, great service. Um, have you only, have you always only done design? Was there ever a time where you guys did design and install? Yes. Um, I sold my Roland VersaCam about 10 years ago. So it's been about 10 years since we actually installed anything. Um, so um, I think that answers that question. How do you draw the mascots freehand first? They just said, yes, yes. All, all the artwork that we use is original um, and hand drawn. And then we vectorize it in Illustrator. Um, another example, you know, a large super graphic of the G, which is related to their name, obviously. Um, the secondary copy, you know, and this you could say is bullet listings, but I have to, when, when you have clients that say home services as a secondary, to me, I have to then say what that secondary means. Um, so home services could mean a lot of things, right? It could mean the guy's going to fix the roof or he's going to, you know, cut the lawn or whatever. So a lot of plumbing, heating and cooling guys that also do electrical, they're saying, oh, we want to be home services and, and that's fine. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them about the challenges of going under a name, just home services is that some consumers still don't know what home services means. So I have to then account for that in, in this way. So um, again, very, very simple design. But if I keep on seeing this van going around with this large G, I think it's going to stand out to me. Um, another another fun mascot based brand that we did with a cool name, you know, Attaboy. So, you know, already I think that they're doing the right thing. Um, it's a cool name. It's memorable. Um, you know, we use some cool half toning to create this this kind of effect here as the blend. Um, and it's a cute character. You know, he, I'm going to remember seeing this mascot around or in a community or in a neighborhood. Another fun one that we did for a company with, again, a good name, and that's sometimes half the battle is a good name, but cool experts. You know, so here's a cool looking bear that goes along with that messaging. And we used, you know, again, subtle background elements. Note that the background elements here are not, are not competing for attention. They are meant to stay in the background while the logo comes to the foreground. So keeping those things in priority, and that's where you see a lot of problems is you see background elements now suddenly coming to foreground and then the logo and stuff is, is at the same level. And that's why the stuff doesn't work and it's why, it's, why it's sometimes illegible. Um, design for a fleet instead of one truck. Um, that's something that we always have to keep in mind, obviously working with a lot of service businesses that have multiple vehicles. You wanna make sure that you design something that can be effective, not just on that first van, but maybe they've got a pickup truck, maybe they've got a sales vehicle or a passenger, a passenger vehicle. Um, and you see sometimes designs that basically, I say they, they design themselves into a corner because now the design can't translate onto different, different canvases. Again, another reason why we typically don't like to use photos because it's hard to then integrate photos consistently across the, across the spectrum of different trucks that they may have. Um, you know, we like to find out upfront what kind of vehicles they have. So if I know they've got, you know, Nissan 2500s high tops, and then they've also got a fleet of pickup trucks. How do I account for that? How do I make sure that the, the design elements are going to work on both and make it look like it's part of the same fleet? We, we do like to use a lot of striping elements sometimes. The striping elements can sometimes really help with that effect. But you know, this is an example it just shows um, you know, three different vans and, and how they still worked regardless. So you've got the Nissan and, and the, uh, the Ford pickup and then you've got the Ford Econoline. You know, you know, again, just trying to be consistent with the angles. I had to obviously flop where the, ma where the mark lived on this one in order to get this layout to work. But you can look at any one of these vehicles and then you're going to have a better sense as to which you know uh that this company is the same company you had seen before so that's the last thing you want to do is have inconsistency across the fleet because then it causes more confusion you know another example 
you know, these are all similar vehicles here, but you can see how RDS on the smaller transits and then how it worked on a larger transit. Uh, very consistent. Everything is, you know, done and coordinated. This is a, a delivery service out in New York City that we, we did their branding for. One of the rare examples for us where the roofs actually got wrapped as well because they are driving around New York City. So you've got people from windows that are able to look down and see that. Um, and here's another, again, simple, very clean design here. And you can see how basically when we went with the idea that all the fronts of the vehicles are going to be this process blue and then all the backs of the vehicles are going to be this darker blue and very easy to integrate that on different canvases. You can see how it works on the pickup truck and how it really works well on the larger canvas. So brand colors are something that we talk about a lot. It's something that we stress as being one way to try to be memorable within the communities that you serve. So we do a lot of research before we brand any company and we ask them about their competition. So we ask to have links to, you know, the top five or 10 different um, competitors that they, they compete against. And I want to study what those brands look like. I want to know what colors these guys are using for their vans because I want to put something out on the road that doesn't look like anything else that might be confused with someone that's already out there. So um, as you work um, on any particular brand or logo, that should be something that's really discussed. And, you know, you really want to think about how those colors can be owned, you know, so if you could come up with a unique color scheme that no one else in the area has, that certainly is going to help a lot. So um, unique colors will aid in the recognition of your brand. Um, avoid the most common colors used for the industry. For example, try not to use blue and red for HVAC. I mean, we certainly have, and we try to do it in a way that looks a little bit different, but certain industries are very, you know, prevalent with the same colors. You know, landscapers might all be using green. So maybe there's a different set of colors that we can use so that you can own those colors in your particular sector. So think more disruptive um, and look to create a brand that colors, colors uh, with colors that no one in your market else deploys, like we said, um, not only in your vertical, but other verticals as well. So, you know, that's going to require, you know, knowing some other vans that maybe different sectors are using. Like if there's, if you're an HVAC contractor, and then there's also a, a landscape company that uses the exact same color scheme, you know, give that some consideration. Maybe there's a way to tweak it so that they might not look similar in nature. Um, so we like to use a lot of our, our wrap designs use splits, which is, you know, two primary colors. Um, we like to look at that from the perspective of how can we have two different brand, two different colors that you typically don't seem uh, deploy together. Um, so I say, I think I've noticed you use gradients. Is that a stylistic? I don't think I've noticed you use gradients. Yeah, we, um, we do sometimes not as much. We use, usually use a lot of straight colors, like pure colors. Uh, but there's a few examples in which we've used uh, some gradients. I'm actually working on a, a wrap design for that Cardinal Heating and Air that's using some gradients. Uh, but not often. A lot of times it's solids for sure. Um, so I guess you could say this has a little bit of gradients, gradients but not... Um, not too many, but again, uh, heating and air company using teal and this dark red, not very typical, right? So this type of truck driving down in the community is going to look a lot different than what most people are used to seeing for a heating and air contractor. You know, there's dark teal color as well, and then you've got the light teal. So this is a great color scheme, and it's something that they can own. Obviously, this, this you know, mascot and the way it's rendered is also something that's pretty unique. So this is, you know, I think a great example of showing color. Um, another company that we, we did the, this brand for, they're actually based in Australia. You know, reds and yellows and whites, not completely atypical, but the way in which it was deployed here, I think makes it atypical. So this is kind of a, a cool example and a, I think a pretty nice, nice van that we did for those guys uh, out in Australia. And it was kind of fun working with those guys and, um, you know, the time difference and talking to them on the phone. And, and it, it, was a, it was a fun project for us. But they have some video of this van driving across a bridge out in Australia. And it just, you know, they, they shot it from a drone. And you just see this van coming across. And it's just, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Like, it's, it's so disruptive and it really sticks out. Um, this is a, a, a company out of New York City that we rebranded and we also renamed them um, and they do uh, commercial heating and air. So, you know, understated to a certain extent because they're not trying to appeal to consumers. They are only really working with commercial uh, buildings, but we wanted to do something here that, again, used some colors that 
if I saw these two colors together, I would know that that's an AirLogix van. They have a fleet of about 10 trucks um, that were wrapped actually by Chris um, out of Dulce Design out in, out in Long Island. He did a great job uh, wrapping these for us. So, you know, a pretty cool color scheme here. This does use some gradients you can see here within the actual brand. And here's RDS actually right in the middle of New York City. So I, I really love this photo because you can see, you know, all this chaos that's happening here and all these things that are going on. And then you've got this van here. And, and obviously it's the focal point of the photo and I get it, but you can kind of see that even in, amidst all this chaos that this van really does stand out. And he's done phenomenal with this, this logo that we created for him. And, you know, it's just such a great brand. And, um, and you know, this is, this is a brand that, you know, the client at first when we showed it to him really wasn't enamored with it, you know, and we really had to, had to talk him through the process of why this would be something that would work for him. And it took a little bit of time to, to have him, you know, really see the value of this particular brand. But, you know, he's our biggest cheerleader right now. I mean, this, this van and this new image that we built for him is doing phenomenal. Um, and, you know, again, best investment ever. He, you know, he'll tell you, you know, hands down. Uh, this is a, a, a retro theme brand that we use, but just note the colors on here as well with this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, pale bluish color here and then this, this teal color. And, um, you know, you could kind of see that it's, you know, in the dark blue. So very unique palette here that you don't often see, which means he can own this space. So he's got these, you know, this light teal color coming at you um, and no one else in his community has this. Tim's going to be my cheerleader too. Thanks, Tim. Um, Oxford Heating and Air, this is based on a, a color that GM used to have on a 57 Bel Air, I think is what I was told. Um, so the client had been using that color scheme for a while and then we introduced the teal and the dark red to go along with it. Um, and this is again, some very unique colors. You know, you don't often see this color for a truck wrap. Um, so he can own this space. You know, when this van's coming at you, you know it's an Oxford van because um, no one else has these colors. Uh, Rogers Heating and Air, again, a pretty cool color scheme. I, I like this one. I like the simplicity of this wrap. It's very um, simple and you can see the R and, you know, very easy to read lettering here. Um, and this is something that, you know, I really like the way these colors are deployed together. The dark blue, the kind of orange red color, and then this teal color. Um, apple green, dark green, again, a nice color combination that you don't see. And you especially don't see it for heating and cooling companies. So that's something I really like for this particular brand too. Um, and then here's showing some typical colors that you do see together, the red and blue for heating and air, but just how we deployed it here in a way that I think makes this be a lot more unique. You know, and this is really a fun brand. It's a really cool website that we designed for them as well. And um, you know, he's killing it. You know, he's doing so well with this, with this brand. Uh, you know, their tagline that we wrote for them is sworn to protect your comfort which really goes along very well with the visuals. So everything is very well dialed in and connected uh, for, for them. This is another one that we did, um, again, like a bright yellow, you know, orangey red color in this teal color for this um, client out in Las Vegas. Um, so to be disruptive in Las Vegas is a, is a pretty, tough, uh, pretty tough thing. So um, I think it's pretty neat how this one worked and uh, you can, uh, he's doing really, that just launched about a week ago. Blanton's purple, again, not very typical. Um, here's, you know, olive colors with a dark red. Um, this particular client, his, his grandfather started the business when he came home from the war. He was a fighter pilot, and that's how he came up with that theme. So cardinal sins of poor wrap design. You know, if you're going to take anything away, these are some things that I think uh, design is not brand-centric like we talked about. The design uses Photoshop, glow effects, or heavy outlines. Those are all things that really are done as a crutch. So if you need to use glows or outlines to make the lettering more effective, that's typically because there's something inherently wrong with the design to begin with. Um, so you'll notice that none of our stuff really ever uses a glow. Very rarely would we ever use an outline as well. Um, so if you're using those types of effects or you need those types of effects, go back to the drawing board. Maybe there's something else wrong with the design itself that's causing them. So. Um, don't use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter icons. Um, all those icons, I don't know why people are putting them on truck wraps. I don't know what they're supposed to signify, or I don't know the, how that helps sell the story of the brand. Um, we've never used them, and we would never recommend any client to use them. Um, big tip, such a simple one, don't use parentheses for your phone numbers. 
Um, it in inhibits legibility. Just use bullets between them. Um, if your design uses an abundance of bullet points, obviously that's a problem. Imagery doesn't convey what the company does. Um, obviously that's not great. Um, using ink or LLC, a lot of clients insist that they have LLC or ink used in their logo. And then we explain to them, well, why doesn't Apple have ink in their logo or McDonald's? Because they're both incorporated as well. Usually that's enough for people to understand why, okay, yeah, I guess I don't need to have ink or LLC in my logo, but I've done 1200 logos at this point and zero have used ink or LLC. And um, so far, none of my clients have been sued by the imaginary boogeyman that's supposed to come after them for not having ink on or LLC on their logo. So I think we're all good on that. So you can tell them they don't need to use ink or LLC. It'll be good. Uh, multiple fonts used. So, you know, again, an example, I don't know what, who designed this or the circumstances, but this company here does what? What's ironic about this is I think this lady doesn't even know what, what they do either. You know, she's confused, like I'm confused here. So, um, you know, um, I, I don't know the name of this company and I'm not sure. I, I don't know. They do siding. So Amer number one brand of siding. So at this point, I'm thinking maybe they do garage doors, maybe they do windows, maybe they build homes. Um, I don't, I don't really know, but yeah, I think I think this might be the name of the company right here. So um, I don't, I don't know what to say about stuff like this, but you can see how this, this unfortunately, the ROI on something like this is very min minimized, and a lot of money was spent on this, and it's, you know, it's sad. Um, I think she says I can't. Oh, I, I can't believe it's something siding. I, I don't know what it is. But anyway, um, um, another example of something that just a lot of things going on. Um, I'm not sure, again, the circumstances here, but note that so many of these elements are just competing for attention. There is no real focal point. There is no real foreground and background here. You've got a lot of things really at the same level um, and a lot of extra things here that normally we would obviously not recommend. You've got a better business um, logo. You've got a QR code, which we would never recommend. I don't know what this number is. Um, you got a, a Yelp logo. Um, so, you know, you could kind of just get a sense here. There's just a lot of stuff going on that are not really um, helping to bring that image, um, to, to tell the right story about that image. Um, your time is our priority. Obviously, if I squint real hard, I can, I can, understand what's going you know what that is but very difficult to read and you've got the glows going around here you've got the drop shadows here um you could ask 90 percent of every homeowner what this symbol is or what these tools are and i guarantee you that none of them know what that is so i, I don't understand why people put symbols like this on their trucks because most people have no idea what that's supposed to signify so um you know just an example of, of something that you know really isn't communicating the right brand promise um, this one I thought was interesting because it's legible and I can at least see what was going on. But um, here's the parenthesis on the phone number, which is something we wouldn't normally do. But super cool, what? So, like I thought at first was like an icy or a slushy machine or something like that because you got the cool bear. And I thought, well, that might be something about it. But it's refrigeration services here. So, you know, that's that stuff is something that, you know, super cool needs to be further clarified with lettering that's more legible. So if refrigeration services is the big part of what Supercool does, then, then make this more prominent on here so that we can better understand. You know, quit overpaying, call us today. I don't know what I'm overpaying for because I still haven't determined what it is you're selling. So, you know, look at it from that perspective and try to think about how it could be um, done a little more effectively. You know, American flags on here, you know, I, I get it, but shouldn't everyone be American? I think that that's, in business, like I, I thought everyone would have to be American. So I don't, I don't know what this adds to the, to the message. So stuff like this just to me is superfluous. Like just strip all this stuff out and, and distill it to the foundation. Like this mascot wouldn't be terrible if it was integrated in a way that made more sense. Um, here's another one just for an electrical contractor. You know, most of the stuff at least I can read, but again, the, the foreground background issue comes to play here. You know, I've got this, this, these lightning bolts and all this stuff going on, and there's a lot of visual noise here. There's a lot of stuff happening all at once. Um, you know, you've got the glows here, which they need because they're going over multiple layers and multiple colors. That's another little challenge. If you see your lettering going over different colors, 
typically it's not advisable to do it that way. Try to keep all, all the lettering on one specific plane or one specific color. Um, additionally, I don't necessarily understand using a lot of spark imagery to go with electric because I thought sparks were the things we were trying to avoid with our electric. So I, I never really understand having a lot of lightning bolts or flashes or sparks because that's not good for electric. So it's, it's a little strange to me, but you can just see even these bullet points over here, we're going red on orange, you know, really terrible distance legibility, but it shouldn't even be in here in the first place. Um, here's another heating and cooling company that is somehow related to a baby. And I don't really know what that um, signifies or how that's related to a heating and air company. It's a shame because they seem to have a decent logo that I would love to see really large over here, but we've focused the whole wrap design on this baby. And I don't really, stuff like that, I don't really understand how that that's related to heating and air. Um, so trademark issues, again, just um, be cognizant of the fact of making sure the design work that you do is original. Um, truck wraps, truck wrap designs that can confuse a potential company in a different market can also be considered copyright infringement. So that's important to note because if you're looking or you, or you're, you want to use a similar design that someone else has already created somewhere else, that design actually is something that can be enforced from a trademark perspective. Um, so understand that you're at risk. I'm going to, I'll show some examples in a second of people that have copied designs that we've created and deploy them on a different business and then got the cease and desist later after in which they had to strip off all that lettering. So just make sure that the artwork that you are, you know, maybe getting inspired for and inspiration is fine. Like we all get it. Um, but make sure that it's, it's different enough so that it wouldn't potentially confuse anyone. If both those trucks were in the same market, that's really the benchmark and they don't have to be in the same market. That's not the standard. It just has to be, if they were in the same market, would it be confusing? Um, know that and understand that clip art is not trademarkable. So if you um, want a design that uses clip art, or if you're being uh, sold a design that uses clip art, understand that that design itself is not something that you can own. So you can't trademark that. Um, obviously, b best advice, hire a reputable design agency to do the design work first. Um, that's something obviously that they're going to be knowing those those issues. They're going to be working with original art typically, and they're going to keep you out of trouble. Um, here's an example. I mean, I don't know how much how much more blatant we can get here um, of someone that has committed trademark infringement and copyright infringement. The exact same mascot, the exact same lettering, exact same color scheme. Um, so um, this client being served with a cease and desist, you know, and it, why? Because they, they didn't want to hire a professional to do it the first time. And they thought that they could just steal something that someone else had paid for. So it just doesn't make any sense. So just be cognizant of that. A couple other examples. Um, the honest guys weren't too honest when they decided to rip off the Blanton's logo. Um, you know, I almost want to say you can't make this stuff up, but this is, this is what happened here. Uh, Victory Plumbing used the same exact mascot and then a, a very poor, um, you know, attempt to rip off the truck wrap design itself. But you can see it's identical. The, those people also got served with cease and desist. Uh, Mozzie Heating and Air, another company, client of ours in San Diego that had our truck wrap design ripped off from a company only about 25, 30 miles away from us. Uh, they got the, the uh, cease and desist and you could see this is what they had to send back showing their truck wrap being stripped off. They had three vans that had to be basically stripped off and all that stuff thrown in the garbage. So the sign company that stole the design was on the hook for that. So um, another example, you know, a uh, duck cleaning company basically tried to steal the same mascot, the same exact truck wrap design. Um, they also got served. Um, Air Experts is another one. You can see this is the passenger side, but basically took the exact same design and then um, sold it to someone else. Um, and I just want to point out too that you know some some companies are opting to try to maybe crowdsource their their design work um, and and use um, you know sites that have crowdsourcing. So here's a couple of examples of our work being sold on Fiverr or being represented as design work that these two um, individuals um, have done. Uh, Sananda here from Bangladesh and. Uh, 
Asiminter, um, you know, did some amazing truck wrap designs, but unfortunately they belong to us. So just understand that what you, what you think you may be buying may either be actually the intellectual property of someone else um, or not an actual representation of what those two companies have done. So again, where to start, hire a reputable design agency if possible. We just talked about the dangers of crowdsourcing, trademark infringement issues. When you crowdsource also, you don't actually speak to a designer. So that's something that you might want to keep in mind because now you're communicating everything through email and stuff. And certainly there can be some language issues because most of the crowdsourcing sites are using uh, people from overseas. Um, and then often um, those people do not understand how to integrate brand for all the other mediums that you may need it to work for. So um, knowing that um, how that brand needs to live in all these different environments is really important. Um, do not use clip art. You know, I say ever because it's, it's, you know, one of the largest heating and air companies in the country has a clip art logo and they have it on a hundred vehicles and um, they can't stop anyone in their community or in their, their neck of the woods from using the same exact piece of clip art because it's public domain. So, you know, make the investment in getting a brand that's original because you know, you're not going to be the same size company you are now and you could wind up in a similar situation. You know, imagine how much, you know, how much that that's, it's terrible for them that they can't even protect their own brand because it's not their brand. It's, it's, it's public domain. So it's really, uh, it's really something to give some consideration to. And, you know, if you're, if you're a designer and you're using clip art in your work and you're selling it, be very careful about the wording in which you um, sell it because you can't sell it as really a logo design. And if you read the terms of the site in which you're getting the clip art from, it's very clear that that cannot be sold as such. You can call it a design, um, I guess, but you can't really call it a new logo or a new brand because it's something that is inherently, you're not able to use for that specific purposes. Um, and that's it. Yeah. So, um, Certainly there's a lot of examples on our site um, for you guys, but you know, at this point too, I know I had a couple of questions um, that I might've missed. Um, do we provide, do you provide sketches or previews or do you allow your portfolio to speak for you into the grid use? Uh, we do not provide any sketches or previews of any of our work. Um, you know, we, we take a, a two thirds deposit on our brand and, um, and truck wrap work and then we start work at that point. But um, yeah, we just basically let our portfolio um, speak to um, a good indication of what we would help, hope that they um, would get from us. And, and for the most part, you know, some people will say, oh, can you show me? And like, yeah, 40 hours later, I can show you. You know, it's just, it's just very difficult for us to just kind of whip something up because a lot of thought goes into it is research. You know, like I mentioned earlier that you have to do, it's just not something that we can really whip out. So. Uh, most people understand that and know that there's a lot of time that's that's invested in it. Um, do you have suggestions for what large contours would take me? Graphs to match scene. So you know the 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 installation questions are are things that you know I try to be cognizant about when we're designing. Um, I know a lot of our wraps. It was you know mentioned earlier in the chat. Um, did speak to uh, or, or have stripes that wrapped around the corners. And I know that they represent some challenges um, as from an installation standpoint. So we do our best to try to account for that. Um, it's helpful for us to have photography, real photography of the vehicles that we're wrapping ahead of time. Um, you know, the flat vector art can only really, you know, it's, it's a crutch only so much, right? So you can't really visualize a lot of the curves and things that go into um, some of the actual vehicles until you see photographs that show how those different bumps and curves will affect the distortion of the lettering. So um, we do try to uh, do try to account for those types of um, of challenges that might come up from the actual canvas itself. So um, the average time it takes to start complete a typical rebound. Uh, so we budget about 40 hours of development time for the logo itself. And then we have usually another 20 hours developed or budgeted for the wrap design. In a lot of instances, we're hired, I'd say 95% of, of the instances we're hired to do both concurrently. 
Um, so we usually work at them, work on them simultaneously. So in a lot of instances, we pitch back to a client how that logo is going to live um, on that particular canvas and, and show them. Because I think if you look um, at, you know, just looking at a couple of logos on a sheet of paper or a JPEG, if you're going to email to them, does not really signify in their mind how it's going to live on that truck. You know, as someone that's done it for so many years, I could look at any brand and I could kind of have a sense of how I might tackle that on a particular truck wrap design. But most clients can't really visualize that. So they, they usually hire us to do both um, at the same time. And I think it's important to, um, I think if you could pitch it that way, it makes more sense. You know, some of I, I think some of our most successful logos that we've done um, were logos that almost didn't make it. You know, and by didn't make it, I mean when we first pitched it without being on a truck, the client wasn't really that um, excited about it. And then we put it on the side of a truck and they got a lot more excited about it. So I think if you can, if you can pitch it that way, I, I think it makes sense. Um, so rates now, you know, I can say that the first logo I did, I sold for $25. Um, and I think we're two and a half million dollars later. Um, it's, it's a bit more expensive than that now. But um, it's taken some time to get to the price point that we're at. But, you know, 40 hours times our hourly rate is approximately really how we come up with a, with a budget for that. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, when I look at some of the brands we've done and I look at what it's done for those businesses and how it's changed their business, I, I still think it's almost um, really undersold to a large degree. I, th I think it's something that, you know, would be something that should be, you know, a lot more um, you know, would be something that is, um, you know, something that, I'm sorry, just give me one second. So, um, I, I think there's a lot of value in the design itself. So I, I, I hesitate to really, I, I don't like when I see a lot of, a lot of sign companies that are, are selling it as part of the design because I feel like it's something that really should be um, sold separately. Um, one second. Okay. How do you protect your design from being reproduced without your permission? If someone wants to do a wrap and I was to use the same design and creative, how do you approach it? So, um, we basically encourage our clients, um, to sell the wrap design. Uh, not to sell the to trademark the the logo itself. So we basically encourage them to trademark the logo once we're finished. Uh, we have an attorney that we work with that will actually trademark their logo, go through the process of registering with the feds. Um, and every logo that we create, we put a TM on it when we're finished so that it serves notice that that is a protected mark or is going to be a protected mark. So um, that's one of the ways that we do it. Um, if someone does steal a wrap design that we've done or a, um, a logo design that we've done. Um, it's not our fight at that point to, to pursue it because we don't technically own the rights to that logo anymore. We've, we've basically sold that to the client. So um, we would obviously notify our client about that and then they would pursue a cease and desist. For example, like Timo's Heating and Air is probably one of the most ripped off brands that we've ever done. I think it's been stolen 20 to 30 25 times or so. Um, like last week alone, they, they sent out three cease and desist on clients that had reused his mascot that were sold his mascot from a crowdsourcing site. Um, so that's again, when we talk about, you know, um, why crowdsourcing can really be problematic because you don't know what you're buying. The people that bought those logos thought that they had bought an original logo. And then they found out after they had wrapped three trucks with it, that it belonged to someone else. So, um, you know, it's just something that, you know, it's, it's sad what, what happens with that, but I'm fortunate that I have a lot of guys like you that know our work and when something's ripped off, you know, we, we get an email about it. It doesn't take long for people to point out our work that's been ripped off. Um, so yeah, Tim definitely sold separately. Um, 
because you know often too if you're a designer and, and then it's not sold separately then then you know people come back later and say oh can i have that design i want to use it for this and you know if it's priced as part of the actual uh, truck wrap then they don't see it as something that they should have have paid separately for so definitely think about doing that um, separately um so that's a good question andrea you know we we do our best to be diligent about making sure that anything we design doesn't infringe on someone else. So we use obviously Google image search is something that we, you know, once we have a design dialed in, we'll, we'll try to use that as a tool. Um, but the reality is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for us to know if that's, that's happened, but the way we minimize it is that we've created it from scratch. So if we're building something from scratch, um, there's a much higher likelihood that it's not something that belonged to someone else at any, at any point. So, uh, fortunately, again, you know, 1,200 logos later, I, I, I haven't run into an instance where something we've done um, mimicked or, or was confused with another brand, you know, knock on, knock on wood, but um, it's something that we try to do our due diligence about as best we can. Um, and then ultimately, um, again, the, the client will pursue the trademark itself with the attorney. Um, how do you manage expectation when you see you are going over? So, um, you know, 40 hours gives us a, um, a, a pretty good uh, benchmark. You know, we very rarely exceed budgets. Um, the only time, you know, that we exceed budget, and, and honestly, it's been a year or so where I think it's really happened for us, is, is if scope changes. So if somebody says um, that they suddenly – had changed their mind from wanting a retro logo design to now wanting clean and modern and I'm, um, you know, a round into it already. Well, you know, usually the first round itself is something that, um, you know, is going to take at least 20 to 25 hours before we can even present anything. So then if you're coming back at that point and saying that you're changing the creative direction that we've already started with, um, that's typically when we might have to have a conversation about the scope change and basically now having to go back to the drawing board. But, um, the reality is, is we've been pretty fortunate that um, the creative brief, which is the process we use at the start, really helps guide us as far as what the client is looking for and what their demographics are looking for. Um, and so we have those conversations to try to narrow down the focus and make sure that we're on the same page. Obviously, we use our portfolio um, as a reference for them, too, so that they can say, um, you know, here's you know, five to 10 logos from our portfolio that we really like. And then you could go over each, each logo with them. And then you have a much better understanding as to uh, what, um, what they're looking for. Um, um, so um, do you provide a couple of directions or just one? So um, no, we usually provide two or three unique um, sketches and those two or three are, are based on what the genre um, is going to be um, decided on. So we'll have those conversations. Sometimes the genres are a little bit varied. It's not like it's, it's oh, I definitely want a retro logo, but sometimes it is like, oh, I definitely want a mascot. Uh, well, what kind of mascot? I mean, there's so many different variants of how we can do mascot design that we would want to, um, you know, maybe explore. So looking through the, our body of work, we can also discuss with them the pros and cons of maybe each genre and even each style, you know, maybe it's more a modern retro, I mean, a, a modern mascot versus something that is, is something that is, uh, you know, maybe rooted in the fifties, maybe they want something rooted in the twenties and you got to talk to them about the differences. The other thing we try to talk to them about is the fact that making sure that what they like is, is married with what it is that the consumer likes. And sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes they really like something um, and it's a personal bias that they might have towards something, but their customer actually doesn't like that and isn't attracted to that or won't perceive the right things from that. So, you know, we've got to make sure that they, that they really understand um, that we're really, our first objective is to try to design something that appeals to their target audience and then them second almost, because I want them to love their brand, but I want the people they're selling to to love it as well. So you gotta try to marriage, marry those up. Um, Michael Stein, do we do private discussions, meetings? Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I wanna show one thing here before, I, before you guys go. As, uh,
you know, th this is the book that I wrote. A lot of the book that um, a lot of the stuff that I talk about brand is really in this book. So um, not to be self promotional here, but you know, the book is available on our website um, and on Amazon too. But a lot of the things that we talk about brand promise is really kind of um, spoken about in, in that book, but, but certainly, um, you know, I, I teach at some of the different rap conferences and uh, I'm involved with, with Dan Neva as well. Um, you know, so yeah, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to do some discussions, definitely. Um, so I'm using that presentation. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad you got the books, Michael, and that they, you found them helpful. I, I, I'm actually really, I'm close to starting another one because I, I, I love the book and I think it's really relevant, but I, I feel like I have so much more to say about the subject. And this was done in 2013. So um, I feel like there's a lot more that, that can be said about it that I didn't include in the first book. So um, I'm, I'm hoping I can get to, uh, to do another one. Um, what are we doing on time? I realized we went a bit over on time. So I'm really sorry about that, guys. I, I know we covered a lot of stuff. Um, you know, any of you guys have questions, just reach out to me, dan at kickcharge.com if you have any questions um, about anything. But, you know, I really appreciate everybody coming out and uh, spending some time with me this afternoon. And I uh, hope you guys learned some stuff. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's, yeah. There'll be a link for this to download. I think it's going to be back on our on our website as well. Um, so I think that um, we'll have it probably in a few days or so. So if if any of your team or any anyone that you wanted to see it um, missed it, they can certainly uh, get on with that. Yep, I I hear you, Michael. I, I, I hear that a lot too. So um, that's, that's not unique um, to, to your shop specifically.